Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for coming out for our winter at FCI Live of 2023. Today, we're talking about navigating partnerships and power dynamics with the Seven Roots team. And actually, the Seven Roots team today will be one member. She'll explain that in a minute. Uh, it is January, and people are falling sick left and right. So in this case, uh, in, unexpectedly, uh, we have Heather here, uh, who is uh, Heather. Is, you can are. I don't know the name of your role. Hmm. I mean, it's a it's a multifaceted role. So okay. yeah, we just sort of. <laughs> I think of Heather as kind of the brain, uh, the person <laughs> who keeps everything coordinated at Seven Roots team, as well as an expert in marketing, uh, owner ownership drives, owner capital campaigns, and so forth. But today she'll be here talking to us about this new challenge, this new an opportunity that's facing startups. More and more startups are not just organizing out there on their own. They have major partners. They're organizing with a nonprofit arm or a nonprofit is the one who founded them. They have a city or county entity that is like co-developing with them, all sorts of interesting or developer, unique partnerships that are forming. That means we need to talk a lot more about navigating power and relationships and partnerships since we're doing this a little differently these days and this trend isn't going away, it's becoming more prevalent. So I am going to uh, stop sharing here and for a second and thank Heather for being here and let her introduce herself and her surprise guest. <laughs> yeah. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, hey, yeah. So let's see. I will start by saying um, thank you all for coming and apologies that I'm not, I'm not here with the whole usual crew. Um, yeah. Lots of illness and, you know, like, JQ said people are dropping like flies right now. So, uh, but I'm here to represent. And uh, so a little bit about Seven Roots also, you know, so some of, I know many of you who are here, but uh, we work with food co-ops on store development and operational support. Um, and the reason we're in this thing is because we really do believe as individuals and as a group in, you know, healthy food access and the co-op model and uh, we're a worker co-op ourselves. So that's, that's the scoop on us. And actually, JQ, do you want to pull up the slides? Sure. I think we can sort of kick off. Oh, okay. Now. I thought you might wanted to introduce your guest where they could see her face, but. Oh yeah. Great idea. Okay. So. We've got Sierra here, though. We're we're so I'm really excited we're here. But Sierra is waving. Uh, so from Northside Food Co-op, who sort of graciously agreed to to join us because um, Northside Food Co-op has a number of kind of pretty incredible uh, partnerships going. And Sierra's experience um, <coughs> when we were developing this, we thought, wow, Sierra's probably got some really good stuff to share. So um, she agreed to kind of come and, and share a little bit of her experience. So um, that's Sierra. And she's going to kind of jump in here in a little bit. We're going to go through um, a few things in terms of what we're seeing and how we're sort of thinking about thinking about it. And uh, and then Sierra is gonna share a bit and then we'll do Q and A. So that's sort of how we're gonna, how we're gonna run things. And um, it's kind of nice, we've got sort of a small group. So um, feel free, put questions in the chat as we go. And um, if we, if it seems appropriate, you know, we can stop and, and talk about them then. Otherwise we'll try to get through as many as possible. Uh, when we get to the end. So um, any questions at this point? Yeah, so we got Sierra here. There she is, you didn't see her wave. All right, so outcomes that we're, we're looking for today. So we're gonna go over the, you know, sort of framework for identifying and evaluating partnership opportunities. Sometimes they come to you, sometimes you go out and look for them, but um, how to think about those. And then, if and when you do choose to go after them, here's how, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, how can we set it all up so that we're successful uh, on all sides. So one thing that we do kind of, we did want to say here is there are sort of no hard and fast rules. Every answer <laughs> uh, to, a, to a given question is probably it depends, right? It's sort of one of those things that comes up for us 
in co-ops all the time is that, you know, we don't have a, a playbook because we're all different, right? We're coming from different places, different communities, different folks are involved. But the hope here is that we'll sort of be providing a broad perspective on what we're seeing out there in the world um, in terms of how co-ops are being approached or um, getting involved with other organizations, uh, what the risks might be, what the opportunities are, and then you know how to think about it. So uh, how to think about it in terms of what's best for the co-op, the community, your owners, and and you know kind of put yourself in a good position. And I will also say I've invited JQ to jump in with any takeaways and whatnot. So uh, hopefully we'll hear uh, some of that as well. All right, so we can jump on to the next slide. And essentially, uh, what we're what we've got going here is, you know, the question is, you know, what's the problem? What are we talking about? Um, and what's happening and what we're seeing is that food access has become just an enormous issue nationally, right? So we're seeing a lot of money flowing from a number of different sources to try to help improve the situation in areas all over the country. So food co-ops, whether your co-op was organized around food access and because of that, or whether it's just that you already existed because you wanted a grocery store and you'll help to address that, are attracting a lot of interest right now from partners. And so then who are the partners? Right. Um, <laughs> so we'll kind of jump down to, you know, who are these folks? We can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, and next one. Thanks for bearing with me on the slide. Uh, so we're, we we kind of put them in a couple different buckets. So the first bucket is government. Right. And so that could be big, small, whatever. If they are affiliated with a government, um, this partner could could look a lot of different ways could be through funding right again whether it's you know super local through your city or county or it's bigger funding through you know state or federal money um that's one way that you could partner up with a, a government government entity to kind of move the co-op forward uh we've seen a lot of actually municipalities or sort of local government entities donating space or land and saying like, hey, this is how we want to be a part of the solution. Um, and then also kind of having government staff on your side. So um, again, that could also look a lot of different ways. <laughs> so whether you've just got people who are pulling strings for you um, or you're working hand in hand with folks, uh, there's a wide range of how we're seeing co-ops uh, working with, with local government staff as individuals or offices. So other funders, so again, when there's money attached, that's where the power dynamics <laughs> come into play often. Um, so we've got nonprofits with cash. We've got individuals with cash, <laughs> uh, religious organizations and grant funders. Uh, one distinction between the, the nonprofits and the grant funders, often grant funders are also nonprofits, right? Um, sometimes it's a foundation or, or something, um, but we're sort of thinking of it in two tracks. There are nonprofits that want to work with you every day, right? Or, you know, in the day-to-day, week-to-week work and, and they have money. And then there's grant funders who may say, hey, it looks like you're aligned with us uh, we have funding and we want to pass it on to you. Uh, give us the report when you're done with the project kind of thing. So again, some some options there. JQ? I was just going to point real quick, um, just some examples. So the nonprofit is usually, sometimes the co-op was actually even started by the nonprofit. Um, so like Gem City, uh, like Detroit People's Food Co-op, both had, you know, a nonprofit that actually 
formulated and birthed the co-op into its own entity. I think that's another way of looking at like, are they like putting like actual, is, is this central to their mission and they're putting like staff into it and they're helping you organize and create the co-op versus the grant funder. Mm -hmm. Sweet, thank you. All right, so next one is just other others, right? So whoever else is interested, um, usually it's, you know, like-minded people who in some way serve to benefit your organization, right? So whether they have a high profile and they can boost you up, um, political capital of some sort, or nonprofits that don't have any money, <laughs> that just want to work together, right? And, and sort of, it becomes more of like a pool of resources, let's see what we can leverage kind of thing. So again, and there, oops, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. This reminds me of situations where like occasionally like political clout, and we're going to talk about how it can be double-sided. I know Heather's going to cut this. Like sometimes a mayor decides to make the food co-op a personal project. That can be a big plus sore. Um, so we've seen <laughs> that. Um, we've actually saw sort of, it was years back, um, that a local famous person, you know, who had become very sp famous in sports ball, I forgive me, I know nothing about sports ball, I have forgotten his name, but um, he decided to like back the project. So uh, there was financial backing, but also like he was pushing it through and using his his fame and uh, to really be a co-organizer to a degree with the co-op. So they're like kind of those levels of partnership. Sweet. Yeah. No, that's great. And that so it can look like anything. The other others are just anybody else who you might team up with in a in a semi public way, right? All right. So now we're going to kind of shift into, you know, this we're going to play this scenario where you are you're considering this, right? So you got a potential partnership and this is how we're going to think about it. Um so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about broadly, what are the opportunities and the risks? So opportunities, you know, this is kind of obvious, right? Cash. We're all going to need a lot of money at some point to put this grocery store we're working on on the earth. So if someone's coming to us with the promise of money, uh, that's very tempting, right? Uh, influence, again, it's, it's not going to happen in a vacuum, so we're going to need people skilled help. That one is is sort of underrated, I think, sometimes and not always something we think about. But um, as volunteer groups, it can be challenging to find people with skills in certain areas or whatnot to kind of impact what we're trying to do. So that one is is one to really kind of keep your eye on if you're entertaining a partnership is like, where could you get, um, where could you fill in gaps that you have on your team? Uh, connections and any and all of those things could lead to a faster timeline, right? So particularly in instances of, um, you know, low food access, right? Where, where we're saying, hey, we wanna get food into this neighborhood. Uh, a faster timeline is really exciting. It's really tempting. So if any number of these, these benefits could help you get there, that could be awesome. So uh, the threats, right? The risks. Um, and they, they abound. Uh, so, you know, messiness, and that could be internal, right? If you're teaming up with another group, um, it could be, hey, this is a mess for us, or it could be messy publicly. Like, what is this? Confusion, right? Like, people might not understand who's doing what. What is the role of these organizations? Why are they together? Um, misperception, you know, about who's driving or what's happening or what's our mission. Um, because again, you've been, and many of these things all that are listed here kind of all tie together, right? So your co-op has been crafting your image and your message and your mission for years now, right? And you've been doing that very carefully. And the idea of tying that to another organization or individual, it offers risk, right? So um, whether it's because 
you know, that person has like, this is what JQ is saying, right? Whether it's, it's the mayor who's uber popular with some people and maybe not so popular with others, uh, or who may be inclined to make political decisions in the future that could come back and be an issue for the co-op. Um, those things, they can be fraught. It can be difficult. So, um, one other kind of area is this sort of internally, uh, if two organizations partner up that are not um, matched in their capacity, it can create sort of, again, the power imbalance, but then there's apathy sometimes, right? It's like, oh, well, I can't make a dent in this, right? We've got, they've got 10 paid staff people, so I don't really need to even... I don't need to be a part of it anymore, right? Even if it's not a conscious choice, it can create issues, you know, within our organizations. Um, and then that lack of ownership piece. So whether it's internal through volunteers and the board or whether our own ownership says like, well, they, we're not, we don't need to be a part of this, right? Someone else is just like taking this thing and running with it, JQ. Yeah, no, I just, like you said, uh, we had one where the mayor was super behind it and made it their, you know, their project. They didn't get reelected and the new mayor didn't want the name tied to the old mayor's main project. <laughs> um, we've seen, other, and I love that you have on here, the lack of ownership. We've seen boards never really fully develop their muscle and know how to lead the co-op because they really feel like the nonprofit's doing it. Um, and yes. so they learn to defer to that other power structure to such a degree. I mean, because they're terrific help, they're putting all that staff on it, like Heather said, um, you know, and, but they have the money, they have the staff. And so the board kind of learns to defer and doesn't build the muscle to really be in charge of the co-op until, and then suddenly opens and they're not really used to being in charge of decisions. Definitely something we've seen happen. Yes. Oh, it's so huge. It's so huge. Um, and it's nuanced. I think that's one of the other dangers is that some of these things are really obvious, right? Like, oh, you want to avoid like, you know, getting together with someone who's like really contentious. But it's it these little, these smaller things that sort of just seep in and then create these fissures or or issues. Um, these are the things to to kind of watch out for. So um, just one other sort of point. To, to jump over to that we have here is the idea of performative or inauthentic support, right? That's okay. So, and the idea being that, you know, you're looking at motivation for these organizations and, you know, why are they looking to be involved, right? And there are times when it, it might be performative but they might come with like a million dollars and you're like, yeah, that's okay. Right. Like we don't, we're, we're going in this with eyes wide open about, you know, why these folks want to be involved. And if the conditions are right, we're good with that. But sort of noting, you know, just kind of exploring that, that why are we here? And, um, you know, is someone is someone seeing this as sort of a, a parachute in to save a community without, you know, toto, totally really being a true partner? Could be politicians, could be other organizations. They might have good intentions. They might not. The point is just sort of sit with that, you know, think about it. All right. So, and then we kind of have a list here of, you know, just a handful, just a smattering of questions that you'd sort of want to consider that, you know, would not apply to all situations, but these are kind of things to get your juices flowing to make sure that, you know, if you're going to align yourselves with someone, um, it's going to make sense, right? So, and, and that you're going to be kind of thinking through all the pieces. So, um, you know, if someone else pays for it, who owns it? Who's got the liability? How are we breaking down the work? How are we gonna create accountability? Who gets a say? What if it doesn't work? <laughs> what do we do then? So having sort of an, an exit strategy. Um, and something that we note a little later on here is 
the idea that if you can't have these conversations, right, they're very practical. There's nothing sort of sexy about them, right? Sometimes they're a little uncomfortable, but if you can't have those conversations with a potential partner and you're going to have a lot of money or influence or intensive work coming up together, maybe that's actually a good sign for where your decision should go. If, if you can't talk through the hard stuff now at the very beginning when everything's really pretty, uh, that, might be, that might be an indicator. So, all right, so now we're still, we're still role playing this. All right, so <laughs> now it, we've got this decision on our hands, right? Hypothetically, we've got this, this partner, this potential partner, we're gonna look at you know, how as a board, or leadership group, can you evaluate whether or not this is gonna be a good move? So uh, first up, you begin by looking inward. So uh, the idea being that as a board and any sort of like staff leadership, you wanna sort of ask yourselves, totally separate from the partnership in question, why does your co-op exist? So what is, what is the outcome you're trying to achieve? Why, why are you doing this thing? And um, I think it's a particularly important question if you've been around for a bit, because the longer you're around, in my experience, the more that question can get muddied, right? Because you kind of like get into all different activities and things and more people get involved. And so getting really clear on that, your mission may have evolved somewhat from when it was written or you know so what do you why do you exist what are you looking to do now and get alignment within your group on that um, it's not that everybody has to agree to every single detail but you have to have pretty pretty solid foundation and document that so you got that and then uh, then you're going to evaluate thinking about this partner again can they help your organization move toward the outcome? So if the answer is no, that's okay, right? Take their name, invite them to engage with the co-op as an owner or a volunteer um, and move on, right? That's okay. Sometimes things happen and they're tempting and we want to grab onto them and it just doesn't actually add up. So, but assuming we're, we're moving ahead here, Great. All right. Step two. So we're going to try to learn more. Uh, so asking some questions, you know, who are these people? And do we have any reason not to trust them? Uh, a reasonable reason, right? Uh, do they pose any risks to the co-op in, in some fashion at this point? And again, we've talked about this already, but at this stage, that would likely be a public perception thing um, that was probably going to be the biggest risk, unless there's also something really obvious, you know, like, oh, yeah, they, you know, have embezzlement issues, but that probably would have knocked them out of the running early on, right? So, so usually we're sort of thinking about, you know, what, what risk could they pose to us? So this is sort of the safety check, right? So then you're asking, all right, great, we've answered these questions. Okay, does this feel safe for us? All right, so assuming yes, uh, then bring them along to you know the next next set of questions. Can I throw in real quickly here? Yes. When you said um, you know any reason not to trust them, I think one of the questions I'd add to this section is what is their motivation, and note all their potential motivations. Like they care mm -hmm. about food issues, right? And they're working on getting reelected next year, or like you know, or, you know, their nonprofit hasn't been doing so good and has, and is looking like to kind of put their stamp back on the map. Doesn't mean it's a reason definitely not to do it, but I would list all of their potential motivations and really think those through in your asking section. Yes, that is, I think, a part of the next step, but yes, I'm totally, no, 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 no apologies necessary. I, this was great. Um, so yeah, and that's the thing. Now you're just kind of like digging deeper, right? What do they want to do? What are they willing to do, right? So like sometimes people come and they're like, wow, we want to make a big difference. 
but like actually their capacity to to contribute is very low in which case it might not be valuable for you to invest in this why do they want to do it what are their conditions right so whether it's conditions to work together or it's oh hey we're going to give you this money but you have massive reporting to go with it right again might be worth it but you want to go in knowing what you're up against um and are those things worth it so are the conditions worth what you're going to get out of it right what's the what's the return on investment and again circling back does all of this right actually align with the co-op's development needs so this one this is like a really key question that i just kind of want to sit in for just a second um i'm going to share a quick story uh i was involved with a startup co-op a lot of years ago and there was a moment where the steering committee was having a meeting they were super early on and someone came into the meeting and they were like oh my gosh I just got access to all of these rain barrels. And I think that we should do this big rain barrel thing. And we're going to do this rain barrel giveaway. And so the steering committee, they went off their agenda and they spent the next like 40 minutes planning the, the rain barrel promotion. And then finally, someone kind of butted in and said, excuse me. I'm I'm sorry. This is this is so nice. Um were we going to start a grocery store? And <laughs> and essentially they had just made this whole plan and they're like it's lovely. They were going to give all these rain barrels out, right? It's 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 arguably a positive impact, right? There are a lot of positive things that we could get involved with in our co-ops. And that doesn't mean that we should. That doesn't mean that we should expend our energy there because everything we do, um, because there is a limited uh, capacity that all of our organizations are going to have um, in a number of different fashions, it's, it's, it's gonna take from something else. So uh, that's one thing to think about is, uh, does this partnership align with where you're ultimately looking to go. And it might be possible that a detour is appropriate for where you are, that you have a really good reason. However, uh, I am forever the advocate for keeping your eyes on the prize and, and keeping it tight and focused in. So, all right, so again, you're evaluating, are you moving them on? So we've moved them on in this scenario. And now it's the brainstorm of all the potential benefits. This is kind of like your last gut check, all the potential benefits and how could this go wrong? And like, you want to spend some time there because I think that goes back to that conversation um, of, of needing to be able to talk through that with those folks and be sure that you're putting the right parameters in place to make sure that it doesn't go wrong or that if it does you've got a a plan right that you can you got it you can pull the cord and figure out how everybody's going to kind of come out of it in in good shape so uh so that's it right so in this again we're here to we're here to move this forward so in this scenario wow you've moved through <laughs> and you've determined that these people are an excellent match for you um, I'm going to pause here and say, are there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat that we need to hit on now. So, okay. Uh, so let's dig in. So this is really, this, like, it's exciting because you made this decision, but really this is the beginning because what we all know is that like many, many things, right? It's like starting a new job or, um, you know, a new relationship, the the end of the, the interview stage is actually the start of the work, right? So um, how to proceed? So we're going to start off with kind of your needs. You need to be clear about the co-op's mission, structure, responsibilities, and intended path, right? So 
revisiting those questions from step number one of your considerations and then you know sharing those with your new partner right and you don't want those folks again to change your course we just talked about that a little bit um and so what that might look like is as simple as you know we exist to put a grocery store in this neighborhood and to carry these kinds of foods right to be very clear about where you're headed you're not here for rain barrels you're here <laughs> for something else all right so establish the baseline um so again talking openly with them you know what are they interested in what's their capacity what do they want to put into this and then get all of that in writing so whether that is through um and we're going to talk about this a little bit later but you know a memorandum of understanding an mou or you know whatever it is you need to kind of just like get it together we do have a good question in the chat. Doesn't have to be for now, but uh, Amanda wants to know: Are we going to talk about solutions if things do start to go wrong with a partner? Ooh, yeah, we can, we can. And right now, I think the hope is that we're going to talk about the framework for how to keep everything in the rails. But yeah, let's definitely jump to that. So again, more questions to ask. You know, who is the team? what are we looking to do together what is the work we will do together right so the outcomes and then the work to get us there and how will we break it down right so having clear roles and responsibilities that is often the solution the the preemptive solution to when things start to go wrong right is oh hey who's doing what we already established this at the beginning all right and then more questions, uh, how will we be accountable, right? So we've established who's doing what and what the work is. Um, now, how will we report to each other? Uh, and so, you know, we always recommend regular meetings, regular communication, uh, some things to, to think about in particular around funding are uh, reporting requirements. We talked about that a little bit, but, um, making sure that you're keeping track of that stuff as you go and that you have someone on point to manage that. And someone who's good at that kind of thing is great, right? Because often <laughs> funding, you know, public funding reporting is, is somewhat arduous, right? That's detailed. You need to sort of really keep track of the, all the different pieces. And some people are great at that. And some people are not. And so, you know, try to set, set yourselves up for success in that way. All right. So then it's about, uh, so again, we talked about the second point. I'm just going to stop here and say, you know, we won't go too, too detailed there um, in terms of, you know, what are talking through what our concerns are between the two organizations. But you want to do it right? Um, but then this first point is a good one because it's, you know, hey, how are we going to talk about this publicly? You know, what is, how are we branding our relationship is essentially what we're saying and who's taking the lead on that? So being aligned in the messaging about what you're doing is huge because it, helps to prevent a lot of that messiness, a lot of that apathy, you know, all of those pieces can be avoided if you and your partner are sort of like on the same page in terms of what we're going to say about the work we're doing together. All right, we can keep moving next slide okay yes thank you just saw that from kim thanks for coming kim in the chat uh so now you've talked about all this stuff uh write it down so formalize these things in the form of again an mou 
project plans, timelines, whatever makes sense, right? You don't need to overwork this thing, but you also want to protect yourselves and you know, be sure that everyone's gonna have something to reference so that if and when things start to go south, right? Then you can go back to something that is, exists outside yourselves. Thank you, JQ, yeah. An MOU, let's talk a little bit about what that is. Um, it's basically a piece of paper that says, this is what we intend to do. And everybody signs it, right? So <laughs> is there anything else you would add to that, JQ, in terms of how to- I think just to keep in mind, uh, memorandums of understanding are great, um, even for basic partnerships and great ways. That's just like, we agree that this is how we're gonna interact. This is who's in charge of what always useful how legally binding it is and how much you involve lawyers will have more to do with how big of a deal this agreement yeah. is but don't be afraid to use mous in in a more informal way also with your more with your smaller partnerships yep yep well and i think that really speaks to that question of you know what amanda asked in terms of like when things go wrong what do we do well you go back to what you agreed to. And then it's easy to, to see, ooh, are we doing this thing, right? This is this thing was established outside of the emotion and the humans of this moment, right? We, we know that those things are mushy and they can be challenging and, and complex. Whereas if we have written this down in advance, it's it's easier to say, okay, how are we doing in relation to this? Not always, but it can be a very helpful tool. So, all right. Jumping all right. down to the next thing. So yeah, this one's a little easier. So follow the systems, right? So you now you've you've done a lot of the work at this point. You wrote it down. Now do it. Do the things you said you were going to do. And if you're not doing the things, and you know, that there are a lot of reasons for it, right? Like, so it builds trust. It creates those outcomes that you're looking to, to create. And um, it also allows for continuity as people move through the, your organizations, right? So if you have systems and you're following them, um, then if your board president drops out, uh, the next board president knows how to do it because there's a system in place. So, and, you know, as always, systems help because um, when the stakes are high, that's not when you want to create your plans, right? You want to have your systems in place uh, when you aren't stressed and you can kind of think through how you want to handle things. All right, so transparency. So be transparent within your board, with your owners and with your partners. And that's especially true if and when you can't follow through. So if something is happening, if you're gonna be late with a report or you've totally like fumbled on something that was supposed to be happening, that's a great time to tell people about it, right? So, so that will help make this path smooth in all the ways. So that's, that's just a, it's always a tip. I consider it a tip for life, but. <laughs> um, and then getting outside advice and support. That's another way that it can just kind of help smooth things, particularly the grocery development, right? Um, you likely haven't opened one before and likely the partner you're working with, not always, but hasn't either. So um, that's a good reason to make sure that you have support in that area in particular. Um, grocery development is nuanced, right? It's very specific and teaming up adds complexity. So since you're both in this situation, um, kind of navigating uncharted waters, uh, 
it's a little tougher than normal. And outsiders are typically kind of positioned to act from a place of logic and reason, right? So hearing from folks with experience in navigating kind of grocery startups or whatever, um, that kind of add vital context and guidance to kind of help you get through the process. So um, all of you are here in FCI Live. So that's a good indicator, right? So um, that's, that's the kind of thing that you just want to be sure that you're bringing in. Um, so that brings us to the Northside Food Co-op. Sierra Washington is here. Um, so a little bit about Northside uh, and Sierra might want to fill in some other details, but um, they are in Wilmington, North Carolina. They are partnered with New Hanover County, which is the county they are in, uh, for funding. and just some bullets on their partnerships specifically. Right now, their building uh, is going to be funded by the county and the store will be owned and operated by the co-op. So there are probably lots of questions about the details of that, which I'm sure that Sierra would be happy to share, but we sort of asked Sierra to share just like some takeaways from her experience. She is the project manager for the co-op. So about, you know, kind of partnerships and how they've approached these things. You know, there's a lot of money in, in the mix with the partnerships they're involved with um, and personalities and all of the things. So I'm going to sort of step back here and let Sierra step in and, and kind of just share from her experience. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Heather, for inviting me. Thank you, JQ, for putting this on. Um, yeah, so I'm the project manager of the Northside Food Co-op. I also want to give a shout out to our strategic partnership coordinator, Claylin, who is in this call. And she told me to tell you she'll be in the chat box if you have specific questions about how we're doing partnerships now, because she'll answer those questions for you. Um, claylin has been with our team for about six months now and has been really helping us get organized and do the parts of like MOUs and really evaluating partnerships and um, doing better because I am one of those people I was like, I wanna work with you and you and you and you and we're gonna do all of the things and it's gonna be great. And we needed to learn how to stay in our lane of building a grocery store while also figuring out how to support the community now. So um, like Heather said, our main funding partnerships have been through local government and they've been through larger foundations. So we received um, initially $15,000 um, donation from Novant Health. And that was kind of a matter of circumstance. One of our board members worked at our local hospital and our local hospital was being bought by Novant Health. So as a way to look good to the community, talking about motivations, um, they wanted to invest in the co-op. So they did that, no strings attached though. Um, and then before that board member retired from the hospital and before the sale of the hospital was made final, Novant Health gave a, a larger lump sum donation of $200,000 to the co-op um, to continue to do our community engagement. And I'll talk about that because that's a little interesting of, of what we do. Um, we've also received funding from the city of Wilmington through their um, American Rescue Plan funds. And that was for $168,000. And that kind of funded a lot of the community engagement that we're doing right now. Um, Novant, not Novant, um, New Hanover County, which is the county that we reside in, there was um, unfortunately a shooting that happened at a local high school in Wilmington. And that shooting um, kind of really jump started our local government to kind of figure out, okay, what are we actually gonna do to address community safety? And they were really taking a social determinant of health approach. And they were saying, okay, we know that this side of town hasn't had a grocery store for over three decades. We know they've been championing for that. And we also know that community violence doesn't just happen. It's because people's basic needs aren't being met. It's because of a whole host of reasons. And so part of a lot of initiatives that the county jump started during that time, they linked arms with us and they said, hey, we know there needs to be a grocery store. We don't wanna 
operate it, but we'll help you build it if you guys operate it. So that became a really strong partner for us. And they committed over $2 million to help with the development of the project and to help with our engagement with um, Seven Roots. So that's been amazing. So our, we've just been kind of blessed in a number of ways to have a lot of financial support recently. Um, and then beyond that, the city of Wilmington donated land for us to be able to build on. So it was kind of like a county city partnership. And if you know anything about the county and the city, they often don't work together. Um, so it was nice that they were doing that. Um, yeah, so those are our funding partners. And then from a community standpoint, our co-op has been around since about 2017, 2018. And we didn't have a lot of funders at the time. We literally started getting all of our funding around the end of 2021, the beginning of 2022. So prior to that, we were trying to figure out, okay, we don't have any funding right now. We need to get support, but we also don't want to make our community wait for food. And we wanted to start engaging with people and building trust. So we started a farmer's market. And it was really awesome. It was led by some of our board members, a lot of interns from the local university and some of our staff members. And we have been hosting a weekly farmer's market on Saturdays um, for a, a little over a year now. And that partnership was um, made with a local food hub, which is called Feast Down East. We purchase a lot of our foods from them because a lot of our farmers were already at other markets. So we had to figure out, okay, we want this farmer's market, <laughs> not a lot of farmers. So Feast on East um, works with us every week to purchase food. We sell it a little bit above cost so we can recoup that and continue selling products. Um, we made partnerships with local businesses and small, uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs. We're constantly thinking of ways to, to bring our community to that market. And then our biggest thing that we launched last summer, which Quaylen was in charge of, so ask all the questions to her in the chat box about this. Um, we started community dinners. We needed something that was a little less formal, that wasn't an early Saturday morning, an opportunity for people to eat together and play together. Um, our side of town is quickly gentrifying. And so people just don't hang out. People don't know each other. People have a lot of misconceptions about one another. And so June of last summer, we basically started weekly block parties and we would shut off the street. We would have music, we had games and we'd set up tables all the way down the street and um, yeah, and serve food. And so that was created through a partnership with a local organization called the Lowercase Leaders. Yes, Heather, sorry. Oh, no, no apologies. This is awesome. I was wondering, yeah, like, so thinking about all of these, what's gone well? And yeah. maybe more importantly, what's not gone well? And don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll specifically talk about the dinners because that was a huge endeavor to do every week. And we partnered with, like I said, another small nonprofit that didn't have a lot of money, but they had the vision, they had the passion behind it. Um, we are lucky and fortunate because we have staff that are paid to do these types of things. That nonprofit was all volunteer based. They're not paid to do their job. And so oftentimes um, they didn't put as much, and I'm looking to Quaylen here, um, <laughs> they, they maybe didn't show up to every dinner. Um, we were doing a lot of the behind the scenes work weekly and they did not, um, yeah, they, they would only show up the day of or wouldn't show up the day of. And we were still scrambling to try and figure it out and make it work. Um, because of that and, and funding, the community dinners cost a lot of money. Um, and so recently we've been, okay, let's have a heart to heart with this organization. Let's really sit down. And we did that at the top of this year. We were like, okay, let's be honest, like completely honest. Because at the end of the day, we're also all friends. So what is your actual capacity? And if, it, and if you don't have the capacity, tell us that. We're not gonna kick you out of the project. We just need to pull in other partners to make this work because the community has like taken hold of this event. Um, so tell us your capacity. Tell us what you're actually bringing to the table. Like we started asking all of the hard questions that Heather and JQ are telling you to ask now that we didn't before. Um, 
and we're slowly getting to that process and we're about to have our first dinner of the year. So we're going to see if all of our hard questions and things paid off. Um, I think in terms of any event that you start, no one is going to be as invested in it as the organization that holds it and owns it. And so with some of the things that we have been um, doing, we've really had to continue to reach out and continue to have that communication. Um, and so that has kind of, we've had to flex that muscle a little bit. And also just, um, I think perspective and, and respect for the different organizations that we work for um, and, and being able to say, okay, we know that this isn't their first thing, but we know that they're invested in this way. So let's give them some grace and let's figure out how to make it work. And if it's not working, we're gonna also have grace for one another and be like, okay, we don't need to do this anymore. Let's not put our energy into this anymore. Um, and those are some conversations we've actually had to have along the way as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is just with our funders, we um, are continually in communication with them weekly, um, specifically the county to be able to keep them updated on what we're doing and we stay updated with Seven Roots. And so just keeping that line of communication forward and, and being able to voice any concerns that we have in a safe space at our board meetings or, or anything like that. Can I ask a question just in dealing with a major funder like that, um, is there any advice you get, I mean, give peers, I'm hearing, you know, stay in open communication, but I feel like there's probably pieces of the project they understand and parts they don't and keeping them up to speed, like any advice you have for like managing this major relationship, but you guys aren't involved in the project in the same way? Yeah, we had a lot of issues at first with the county and the city not understanding what a cooperative grocery store was and not wanting to take the time to. Um, and that was when we were mainly working, and this isn't shade at anyone, but this is when we were working with higher up levels of local government. But once we got to the actual county staff that was assigned to our project, they were more willing to have these like deeper conversations and understand our project. So I think also recognizing who your audience is and who you're actually working for. The county commissioners, um, the city council members, maybe they want to know all the ins and outs and geek out over it like we do, but most likely not. So give them the big details, give them the things that make them sound great to the public. And then the staff members that you're working with with local government, that's where it's worth really digging in and really getting them to like see things. That's some excellent advice, thank you. That's really good. And I will say also, one thing that I've seen Sierra do is be really bold. And in a meeting where people are making assumptions or barreling forward or whatever, like I've seen her just advocate for her organization and say, well, actually, I'm not sure that you read the pro forma, you know, not really pointing a finger, but sort of saying, well, this is what the numbers show. This is what the industry says. This is, and just sort of using, using facts and sort of doing that thing that we talked about, which is sort of maintaining the focus on, we're here to set this thing up to be successful. And that's going to be inconvenient along the way. And it's not an option, right? It's not optional. The, the inconvenience will be there and we have to kind of make our way through that murkiness. So I, yeah, I don't know if, if Sierra's being modest, but uh, <laughs> she's been really good at that and, and their whole team has. Yeah, and I'll say Quaylen having the specific title of strategic partnership coordinator, like she is really helping us define, like, do we have the capacity to do this new thing? Um, and do we, like, what are we specifically asking of this organization and having our internal conversation? And then something I think that we try and intentionally do with any partnership with anyone at the end of every conversation, we're like, okay, so this is how you're helping us. We love it. Great. How do we support you too? So we make sure we're always really big about mutually beneficial relationships. We never want to be seen as an organization that just receives all the time. Um, and so that's something else to consider. 
do you guys have, and maybe this is a quailing conversation, but do you guys have any examples of like any, any like even written down bullet points or like anything you guys put together with partners and when you guys come into a partnership? Do you want me? Okay. You, do you want to talk or you want me to? I, okay, sorry. All right. So yes. So with our partnership with, for our community dinners, we basically created an outline and we Googled all of the questions, but tailored them to um, what that relationship is. Um, so yeah, and we can share it out if anyone wants to see it, but it was basically just asking about like, what's your capacity, what resources, whether it be financial or um, in kind, can you provide to this effort that we are doing together? Um, what time commitment are you able to do? What's the best form of communication? How are we gonna hold each other accountable if one of us doesn't show up or do what we said we were gonna do? Um, and that's our first time doing this. So we'll see February 23rd, <laughs> what happens and if, if it actually works out. But yeah, I'll share that, that resource out with everyone. Excellent. Oh, well, great. I will collect that from Sierra and Amanda offered a copy of their MOU as a nonprofit working with a startup food co-op uh, with some redacted notes. And so I will follow up with both of them and get that out to you guys. Heather, did you have any wrapping up comments you wanted to make before I wrap up? No, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, we'd hope to do Q&A. We can do it for one minute, potentially, but uh, <laughs> but maybe we maybe we aren't, aren't going to make it. But this was great. I just wanted to say thank you for, to Sierra for kind of sharing from that because we can talk about, you know, oh, this is how you do it. But, you know, Northside Food Co-op is like on the ground doing it every day. So I'm, I feel really grateful. Thank you for for joining us. Quaylen and I and don't know Sierra. if these these speakers have the time to stay, but if they do, we can stay after the recording. I'm going to wrap up recording right now with my little uh, my little spiel about the rest of the series and thanking them. And then we're going to see if anyone wants to stay and talk a little longer. But yeah. I do want to hang out. Good. I want to give a huge thank you to Heather and our you know unplanned rock star, Sierra Washington here, project manager from Northside Food Co-op, uh, helping us learn a lot today about navigating partnerships. Really deeply appreciate you guys. Um, Coming up next, um, tonight we have the most fun member input process ever. Miriam Gu is with Co-op Co-Everything and they ran an a open owner input process on the design of the Dorchester Food Co-op uh, to really make it reflect the owners. She's gonna tell you some of the key things that they utilized and actually put you into rooms and put you to work to utilizing some of the input strategies so you can take back and use in a lot of ways at your co-op. Tomorrow we'll have Katie Novak talking about are you capital campaign ready? Long before you actually start launching the campaign, there are things that have to be right and have to be in place. And some of them are not intuitive. Katie will be here sharing what has been behind the success of successful capital campaigns. And then we have uh, also on Wednesday, the GM hiring process panel. I'm psyched about this one. Uh, Dorchester Food Co-op, Food Shed and Wild Lady Market all have successfully hired GMs that they have a great relationship with. They're gonna talk though about the nitty gritties of the timelines, where they went looking for GMs, where they listed the job, what, what outside professional support they used and didn't use and what they wouldn't repeat. <laughs> so please do join us for that. Real quick, this series would not be possible without the support and funding of the USDA, National Cooperative Bank, National Cooperative Grocers, and CoBank. Thanks so much to them.